The Radio Tube Patent, U.S. Patent No. 1. 109. 866. Issued to Lee De Forest in 1913. Welcome to Patentomatics. In today's video, we will talk about the Radio Tube Patent, U.S. Patent No. 1. 109. 866. Issued to Lee De Forest in 1913. Oh before this video starts, please share, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more updates. By the late 1920s, most commerce ships were equipped with modern vacuum tube radio technology, which eventually superseded the antiquated spark, gap systems. By utilizing high, frequency or short, wave bands, this new piece of technology could send, and receive signals nearly all over the world. Tube technology enabled a considerably, finer tuning of radio signals compared to spark gap technology, which was previously used. Morse code continued to be the standard for naval communications, even though tube technology could be used for speech transmission. This was because Morse code was more dependable for sending signals over great distances. By the 1930s, the fundamental layout of the tube radio had been developed, and it remained in widespread use aboard commercial vessels until the 1980s. In 1906, Dr. Lee DeForest was the first person to invent the vacuum tube. His tube, which he termed the Audion, was initially designed as a detector of radio waves, and was soon accepted by shipboard operators. He came up with the name for his invention. Experiments conducted in later years by DeForest and others demonstrated the capability of the vacuum tube to generate radio signals with a level of precision that was significantly superior to that of prior systems. By 1914, the fundamental aspects of transmitters based on vacuum tubes had been figured out. The fast development of new technology for military objectives that occurred, as a direct result of World War I led to tube-based systems beginning to supplant spark systems as the standard for naval radio throughout the post-war decade. The military transport in 1943, construction began in New Jersey, on the first ship of the general class of World War II P-2 troop carriers. This ship was named General John Pope. The case containing her radio equipment is located to your left. During World War II, the Pope was assigned to duty as a naval transport in the Pacific Theater. During both the Korean War and the Vietnam War, she served as a vessel for the military sea transport service after being reactivated. In the early 1970s, Pope Paul VI spent some time recuperating at Sassoon Bay. The work done by prior experimenters served as inspiration for De Forest's invention of the Audion tube. In the 1880s, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, which consisted of a single filament. Around the year 1900, Ambrose Fleming attached a metal plate to a light bulb to create a detector of radio waves using the light bulb. DeForest's addition of a third component a wire grid resulted in a substantially superior detector and, ultimately, the capacity to magnify and create electromagnetic energy. He is credited with discovering this ability. 1915 DeForest Audion tubes were used in receivers long before the invention of tubes that were used AS transmitters. Sets such as this DeForest RJ-6 were used by shipboard operators for Marconi and RCA during the Spark era. These sets were purchased privately and used without the authorization of the companies. These were significant improvements over the equipment that was supplied by the corporation. While the ship was in port, the receivers had to be stowed away in a secret location, so that the corporate inspectors would not find them. The triode or Audion amplifier was developed by Lee DeForest, 1873-1961, who also designed the technology that made it possible to broadcast radio signals wirelessly. While attending Yale University, DeForest's mechanical and gaming inventions helped him contribute to the cost of his education. When he first started working on his Ph.D., which he eventually earned in 1899, he decided to concentrate his studies on the radio. During DeForest's studies, he started to have the idea that the diode vacuum tubes that were available at the time may be improved in some way. These diode tubes sustained an electromagnetic current between their two electrodes, which were designated as an anode, which maintains a positive charge, and a cathode, which maintains a negative charge. They were not sensitive enough to react to shifts in the electromagnetic radiation that was incident on them, and while they could rectify signals, 
changing them from AC to DC, they could not magnify signals. By 1006, De Forest had solved these issues that were straightforward but brilliant, he inserted a third electrode in between the two that were already there. The triode or audion tube that was patented by De Forest could both rectify and amplify, and its improved control meant that a variety of electronic circuits would finally be possible for use in commercial settings. In 1902, De Forest made the first known prediction on the potential for radio broadcasting, and in 1907, he established a business to make commercial radio a reality. Nonetheless, despite De Forest and other scientists' ability to successfully demonstrate their findings in public, the general public remained unconvinced. The United States District Attorney filed a lawsuit against De Forest in 1913 for allegedly deceiving his stockholders by making what the lawsuit referred to as absurd claims. But De Forest persisted, and in 1916 he achieved not one but two milestones. He broadcast the first radio advertisement for his products, and radio stations reported on their first presidential election. The accomplishments of Lee De Forest extend far further than the connotations of his appellation, father of radio. Throughout his professional life, he was awarded more than 300 patents, his audion tube went on to become an important component not only of commercial radio but also of telephones, televisions, radar systems, and computers. Although solid, state transistors have long since replaced the cumbersome audion tubes that were initially employed in these devices. The zeal and ideas of Lee DeForest were instrumental in paving the way for the age of electronics. After finding work with Western Electric in Chicago at first, DeForest traveled to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to begin working for the American Wireless Telegraph Company not long afterward. During his time in Milwaukee, DeForest came up with his first significant invention, which was called the Responder. This device was supposed to take the place of the Coherer, which was a radio wave detector that consisted of metal filings and a tube. The coherer tended to lose its sensitivity over time and required that the tube be shaken at regular intervals. In the responder developed by De Forest, the filings were discarded and replaced with a liquid electrolyte, which did away with the requirement for manual restoration of the detector. After receiving payment for his services as a responder, De Forest relocated to Chicago and, along with a business partner, established the American De Forest Wireless Telegraph Corporation to compete with the enterprise run by Guglielmo Marconi. For fund raising, De Forest went on demonstration tours, during which he showed how Morse code messages could be sent and received wirelessly. De Forest was able to get orders from several branches of the United States military, with the assistance of his marketing effort and the attention he produced by sending reports on the Russo-Japanese War with his equipment. After beginning sales of a responder with a new design in 1903, De Forest encountered the first of many commercial challenges that would haunt him throughout his career. These challenges would continue to dog De Forest until the end of his life. A few years later, it was determined in a court of law that the improved responder violated a patent that belonged to Reginald Fessenden. As a result, the court ordered DeForest's company to stop producing the improved responder. Even more disastrous for DeForest was the fact that he discovered embezzlement within the corporation, which he had left in 1907. By the time his ties with the corporation were terminated, DeForest had already built a device that would not only bring about a fundamental shift in the practice of telegraphy but would also clear the path for the development of a wide variety of other technological advancements. In the year 1904, John Ambrose Fleming received a patent for a two-electrode vacuum tube that had the capability of functioning as both a rectifier and a radio wave detector. Although Fleming's invention could convert receiving radio signals into a form that was suitable for vibrating the diaphragm of an earphone, the received signals were not powerful enough to make this use of the device practicable. This issue was resolved when De Forest developed the first three electrode vacuum tube, which he called the Audion. The new device served not only as a detector but also as a rectifier and an amplifier, so it was able to solve all three problems simultaneously. In 1907, De Forest received a patent for the Audion, although he had very little comprehension of how or why the device operated. In addition, it would be several years before the triode's full potential was utilized in any way. Around the year 1912, De Forest created a cascade amplifier circuit by connecting the output of one triode to the input of another triode. 
A few years later, he came up with a regenerative circuit in which the output of a triode was connected to the input of the same device. The second discovery was made by other people at roughly the same time as the forests, N.E. Howard Armstrong was awarded the patent for the feedback circuit at the beginning of the process. Amplification of a weak current, rectification of an alternating current, AC, to direct current, DC, generation of oscillating radio, frequency, RF, power for radio and radar, and creation of images on a television screen or computer monitor are all common applications of vacuum tubes. Other applications include rectification of an AC to DC and alternating current to DC. Magnetrons, klystrons, gyrotron, cathode, ray tubes, like the thyrotron, photoelectric cells, also known as phototubes, and neon and fluorescent lamps are all examples of common forms of electron tubes. Up until the late 1950s, practically every form of electronic device, including computers, radios, transmitters, components of high-fidelity sound systems, and so on, utilized vacuum tubes. After World War II, the transistor was perfected, and solid, state devices, which are devices based on semiconductors, began to be employed in all applications that required low power and low frequency. Initially, the consensus held that solid, state technology would quickly render the electron tube obsolete. However, this has not proven to be the case, as each technology has grown to dominate a specific frequency and power spectrum. Electron tubes predominate at power levels that are fewer than hundreds of watts, and at frequencies that are lower than 8 gigahertz, gigahertz, while solid, state devices predominate at higher power levels and higher frequencies. Radio transmitters, radar systems, and other electronic warfare devices have traditionally required high power levels. Microwave communication systems may also demand power levels in the hundreds of watts range. Klystrons, magnetrons, and traveling, wave tubes are routinely used in situations like this to supply the necessary power. The most common applications for gyrotron are deep, space radars, microwave weapons, and drivers for high, energy particle accelerators. Gyrotrons are capable of producing extremely high average power levels, which can reach several megawatts at frequencies higher than 60 gigahertz. How did you like the video? Do you like it? Leave your valuable comments in the comment section below, and don't forget to like share and subscribe to our channel Potentomatics on YouTube.